G'day folks, Ziggy D here with a look at Drox Operative 2, the newest action RPG from a rather creative and underrated indie developer, Soldak. Soldak takes the ARPG genre and messes with it in some unusual ways, and it's always a real treat seeing what new ideas they are exploring with their games. Drox Operative 2 is like if you were playing an action RPG within someone else's game of Stellaris. The setting is a grand strategy featuring major and minor factions going to war, forming alliances, claiming territory, and trying to carve out their place in the universe. And then you, the Drox operative and agent of the mysterious Drox organization, come along and help them all become best friends to build a peaceful galaxy. And sometimes that involves espionage, spreading rumors, breaking up alliances, warmongering, stealing technology, and planetary bombardments, with a little bit of gently encouraged species extinction thrown into the mix. You create, level, and improve a persistent character across multiple campaigns. There's a ton of different races to choose from with focuses on different build archetypes, as well as some unique skills and bonus slots for gear. You can even unlock some unique minor races to play as you discover them in-game. I've played a bunch of the different races at this point, and there are a ton of different ways to build each of them. For this run, I've decided to give the Hive a go, which seems to focus on fighters and projectile weapons with some nice raw defense. Starting at level 1, you set out in a fresh sector of the galaxy and begin meeting the different factions, taking on quests to help them out while building up relationships. Help out a faction and they will grow stronger, and they may even form an alliance with you directly and offer unique aid. Sell them technology, the location of valuable planets to settle, and protect them from hostile forces while watching them grow and evolve. Each of the campaign missions can be won in a variety of different ways. For the warmongers out there, there is the, of course, military victory. Be the ally of the faction that destroys all of the other factions, or I guess ally with someone and then destroy everyone else yourself. For the diplomats, there is a diplomatic victory, which involves making sure that everyone is friends with each other as well as you. Though the definition of friends in this game includes vassals and other forms of brutal subjugation. Diplomatic victory is probably my favourite because it can be a rather complex puzzle to get everyone to a state of stable peace. Economic victory means simply making a ton of credits for the guild, selling technology, trading planet data, looting and questing can all do this, though dying costs the guild money due to expensive cloning fees and that can set you back. A fear victory means terrorising the factions by killing their ships until everyone basically submits to Drox control just out of pure terror. A legend victory means becoming a legend, not killing factions, but focusing exclusively in making a name for yourself by killing powerful monsters and other threats in the universe. And finally, the guild victory is to complete enough of the Drox guild's own quests, which can be complicated and sometimes counter to your other plans, such as brokering a peace between two warring factions, manipulating other factions into war, or boosting a weak faction into the strongest in the sector. Each win condition rewards you in different ways at the end, and there are also lose conditions such as not being allied to the conquering faction, or costing the Drox guild too much money if you keep dying. When you first start out in a campaign, you won't necessarily know which win condition you will go for, and Drox Operative is very sandbox, so it's up to you. So this video I kind of wanted to take the format of actually just playing the game for an hour or one campaign here, and kind of running you guys through what happened. In this run I started out by exploring and looking out for species to contact and get some upgrades for my ship going. Each campaign you'll start out weaker than the enemies you'll be coming up against pretty quickly, so getting established and building up some ship power is pretty key. You want to get powerful enough that your actions can start influencing the state of the grand strategy in major ways. I quickly discovered the Apex faction and started scanning the nearby planets to sell them the data for some quick cash. If you find a valuable planet that has good resources on it, those can be worth a bit of money, although not all planets are worth a lot. It also depends on how wealthy the faction is too. Something interesting happened though, on one of the planets was actually a lost human colony, which got me a second contact right off the bat. Two quick contacts right at the very beginning is a great start as we can get right on questing to build up some power and relationships. You're not always this lucky and sometimes it might take quite a time to find the first faction that you encounter. Via the relationships screen you can see all of the factions that you've discovered so far, as well as what they think of each other and you. You can also contact each of the factions from here to trade and discuss politics. I sold the contact details of the humans to the Apex to see how they would get along, but also for some quick cash. From each of the individual faction screens, you can also learn about the factions to find out that whether they're, for example, pacifist xenophobes, as well as the services they can offer you and what they're good at in general. There's quite a lot of detail to the factions, and certain factions may be inclined to not get along. 
Once you establish contact, you can also start taking quests from each faction, though you can technically do most quests in the game without first accepting them, just doing things in the sector and helping people and then turning in the completed quests as they show up. However, accepting the quests helps you focus and learn what you need to do and where. It's a good idea while learning especially, to focus on accepting and trying to do critical and important quests. And here's why. So the questing system in this game is actually super interesting, as quests change, create new problems, and have an impact on the races and their success in the grand strategy. Say that there is a baddie called Zebnark threatening the Apex. The Apex might open a quest to go and kill him and tag it as a critical priority as he's a big threat to them. Now if you don't kill Zebnark because you're doing other things, after a while Zebnark might recruit a bunch of underlings, which spawns another quest to kill the underlings. If you don't kill the underlings, then they may start raiding one of the Apex planets, which spawns another quest to protect the planet. Meanwhile in the background, old Zebnark is building a black hole device which spawns another quest. Now if you had just killed Zebnark right away, none of this would have ever happened. But of course, while you're doing that, other things are happening in the background elsewhere and the game is progressing. There's this whole simulation of quests evolving and creating other quests in the game. It's pretty nuts actually how much is going on behind the scenes. So I get questing for a while and explore, discovering the Utopian faction who seem to have a non-aggression pact with the Apex. We don't yet have a clear path to victory, but we're getting the lay of the land and building up some power and credits as we level and upgrade our ship. After a while I figure out that the Utopians have made contact with another race called the Chell, and I buy the contact details to the Chell to find out that the Chell and the Utopians are at war, which is a great opportunity for us. I offer to declare war on the Chell and sign a non-aggression pact with the Utopians in exchange for some bonus credits, and they accept. The Chell are currently stronger than the Utopians, but with my aid I think we can swing the war in their favour. Now I don't currently know where the Chell are, so I decide to get a little bit crafty. I offer to sell the Chell the contact details of the humans, which they quite clearly want, in exchange for data on their planet locations. They aren't too smart, apparently, because even though we're at war, they accept telling me exactly where to find them. I make my way over with my army of fighters that I've been building up, and newly upgraded gear, and I start unleashing some diplomacy on the Chell, destroying their defenders and blowing up their research station. As I bombard their planet, they frantically signal me their surrender, but sadly, I do not hear their pleas, and the Chell are no more leaving me to claim some treasure from their dead world and get a serious relationship boost with the Utopians for bringing peace to their system once more. Now just before all this went down, the Drox Guild actually contacted me and set me a task. These Drox missions are optional, but they are one potential path to victory, and they can pose some pretty interesting challenges to shake up the game. In this case, they want me to boost the humans to become the strongest faction in the sector. Checking the faction's screen shows the humans are currently on top as far as I know, but that's only the known factions, so someone else I have yet to discover is actually more powerful than the humans. If we want to get the humans on top, then we have to both help the humans grow, but also find whoever is currently in the lead and knock them down a peg. So I continue exploring and building up my own power while improving my relationship with the humans so that I can work on an alliance with them. You can build relationships with factions in a ton of different ways. Questing, donating items and technology, trading and helping them in wars or even defending their ships and planets from random attacks. All build relationship. And as your relationship strengthens, you can sign non-aggression pacts and mutual protection pacts and eventually an alliance as well as things like trade pacts or free info pacts to automatically share and trade technology and discoveries. Now in addition to passive points and gear that you find in Drox 2 to upgrade your character slash ship, uh, Drox 2 compared to Drox 1 now has a separate tree for ship and racial upgrades. These cost points that you gain as you level up, as well as credits. Some of the passives can be very strong, but the most key thing is the ship size and class upgrades. These upgrades give you extremely valuable additional slots in which to equip more components and weapons. They do come at a cost though. Bigger ships are heavier, and so slower and easier to get hit by enemies. But this trade-off is generally worth it for the extra power an additional item slot implies. So back to the story, my mutual protection pact with the humans ended up getting me pulled into a war with the Apex. As our goal is to boost the humans, helping them in the war is pretty crucial as an extended war could bog them down and let the Utopians, who are currently rivaling them for power, continue to grow in power and take the top position. As well, there is still the other unknown race which is gaining power in the background, presumably. So, I head back to help the humans out, 
and at this point I'm stacking some pretty serious firepower so it's kind of a shock and awe moment and the Apex quickly offer to become my vassal. I end up accepting their offer of vassalage, I guess I'm getting soft. Now a more important war has also cropped up in the meanwhile. The Utopians have been rapidly growing in power and outstripping the humans actually, and tensions eventually boil over between the two into war. At this point I have an alliance and I obviously get pulled into that war as well. While this perhaps could have been avoided and the humans could still have been boosted in more subtle ways, such as sabotaging the Utopians while helping maintain their relationships, a war is a pretty swift and direct way to get the humans on top. At least until we discover the secret other race that's currently in hiding. My damage output has been growing out of control and I have three powerful mass drivers and two squads of fighters at this point. So this war is a pretty swift affair and the Utopians are wiped off the board completely in short order. This leaves me finally with some free time to track down the secret other race. Now as I'm exploring looking for them, the Drox drop another quest on me. They want me to see the Fringe and the Mentago at war. I had met the Mentago earlier but I hadn't met the Fringe yet. The Fringe turn out to be the missing piece of the puzzle, a faction growing in peace and harmony in an isolated system nearby. We can't have that. Everything is lining up. We still have to find them though, and after a short while later I actually find one of their exploration vessels and contact is finally made. They're pretty friendly and trusting. It's time to bring all the pieces together. I turn in a bunch of quests for the Fringe as I had solved them incidentally, and after all my profit is still a priority here. So next what I do is I buy the planet information and jump gate codes to their sector, in the interest of free and peaceful trade of course. I give them pretty valuable laser technology in exchange but I don't really think they'll have a chance to implement it. So I head over to their home system and get an idea of their planets. Two wealthy and peaceful planets in the Sarazen system. So I get into position in orbit over their homeworld and sell the fringe the contact info to the Mantago, the faction that the Drox wants to see them at war with. Then I ask them politely to declare war on the Mentago. <laughs> and at this point the Fringe seem to for some reason trust me completely so they happily agree, fulfilling the Drox war quest. Then I get the humans on the phone and tell them that we're going to war with the Fringe. They say that's fair. After all I have been guiding them to dominion over this realm, why would they argue? And after closing the communication screen, all hell breaks loose. Thousands of lives are lost swiftly in this war, and an orbital bombardment of their home planet sees a swift surrender as the humans claim their place as the leaders of this region. The Drox are stoked at my efforts, and my first campaign with this character is won through a guild victory. Even if I hadn't got the guild victory here, I think we were on a pretty swift path to a either military or a very militaristic diplomatic victory potentially. So that's about one hour of Drox and one campaign on a level one character. It can be a pretty eventful affair at times and lots of fun organic stories arise out of the game. After completing a campaign you can begin a new higher level one in a different area and they play out differently each time. You take your same ship and all of your gear and levels and everything and they all carry over into the new campaign. So you get stronger and take on greater and greater challenges as you progress. Even some of the things you've done in previous campaigns will carry over as well. So if you really help someone like the humans for example and you encounter them later in a different sector, they will be more inclined to like you because of the support you've lent them in the past. You can however reset this entirely and have it be a completely fresh experience each time. You can also change a bunch of settings to make future campaigns on that character different or more difficult, and there's also very fun challenge sectors that have unusual situations to mix things up. Overall I've had a blast with this game, but I think you to an extent get out what you put into it. If you try and make things interesting, they will be more interesting. Shooting for different victory conditions, taking on uh, Drox quests that are contrary to your current goals, mixing things up will keep the game I think a lot more interesting and you'll tell many different stories that way. Like most of Soldak's games, it's a bit rough around the edges, and it's not the prettiest graphically, but it's super interesting with a ton of neat ideas and mechanics. I always love to see what Soldak brings to the genre. If you'd like to suss it out, you can find Drox 2 and a bunch of other awesome indie games on sale on my official game store, linked in the description below. My store is directly partnered with each of the devs, and a cut of the sales supports me as well. So obviously I appreciate you checking it out. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm ZD, and thanks very much for watching.